Well, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to another discussion with my colleagues, Jonathan Jerry and Emily Shore from the McGill Office for Science and Society. And we continue to investigate uh, COVID-19. And of course, there's a lot of investigation to be done there because information changes very, very quickly. This past week was dominated by this emergency use authorization of convalescent plasma in the US. Uh, this is something that was uh, uh, pushed by President Trump and uh, the FDA uh, kind of gave in, I think, to the, to the push and came out with this uh, emergency use um, authorization. <laughs> This uh, merits a little bit of discussion because uh, the numbers that were quoted both by the president and by Stephen Hahn, who is the commissioner of the FDA, uh, were uh, extremely misleading because they did not make a distinction between relative risk and absolute risk, which we will uh, certainly uh, discuss. But just uh, to give you a little bit of a background, because we have been asked questions uh, about this, and, and uh, these questions have come in through our, our Facebook page. And um, the fact is that uh, the notion of using uh, convalescent uh, plasma to, to treat disease is not a new one. In fact, it goes back well over 100 years when uh, von Bering, a German uh, physiologist, uh, first treated uh, diphtheria and dysentery and other uh, such diseases with convalescent plasma. Animals would be exposed to the invading organism and they would uh, isolate the, the plasma, which is the liquidy portion of the blood. Uh, when you centrifuge blood, the blood cells go to the bottom and you get this yellow liquid on top, that's called plasma. When you remove the clotting factors from the plasma, that is what is called serum. So over a hundred years ago, both plasma and serum were, were used and, uh, uh, of course, they didn't know that what was uh, active in there were the antibodies, which was uh, later uh, basically identified by Emil Fischer. Uh, and uh, it was very interesting that uh, until the advent of antibiotics, uh, this kind of therapy with, with serum was, was very, very common. Uh, there were issues, uh, people would have allergic reactions, they developed fevers. Uh, so it was not ideal, but at least it was effective for a number of, uh, of conditions. So basically, and then antibiotics came along, and of course that that resulted in, in, in basically the abandonment. And except in a few situations, uh, today for botulism poisoning it is still used, uh, and uh, for ricin poisoning. So there, there are still uses. So and then along came a, a new variety uh, of. of uh, uh, antibodies called monoclonal antibodies. These are, are made in the laboratory and they're very specific for what are known as antigens. The antigens are the invading organisms, whether they be bacteria or viruses. And uh, this holds a great deal of potential for the future, the possibility of having a very specific antibody that, that will target the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Okay, but this business of emergency uh, use authorization of convalescent plasma, means that uh, people who have survived uh, an infection and have donated their blood and uh, antibodies have been isolated from their plasma and these antibodies are, are, are now being used uh, to treat the disease. And uh, when President Trump introduced this uh, the other night, he talked about 35% benefit. And uh, Stephen Hahn, the commissioner of the uh, FDA, went on and he specifically said that if 100 hospitalized patients were treated in this way, 35 of them would uh, survive, the others would die. This is, is totally wrong because what he was talking about uh, was relative risk, not absolute risks. And Jonathan, maybe you can come in here for- uh, Please, uh, <laughs> enlighten us <laughs> as to what, what of, that even means. You know, the difference between relative risk and absolute risk, and then we'll talk about the specific numbers that were really seen in this particular study, which was carried out by the Mayo Clinic and did involve about 35,000 patients. So it's something that is meaningful in terms of the number of patients that were involved in the study. But what is the difference between absolute risk and relative risk. Yeah, so I haven't explained this in a while. So let's let's wrap my head back around this. But this is this is indeed this is a common issue that we see 
when science gets reported and sometimes it comes from the scientists themselves because the absolute the the sorry the relative difference uh is usually much more seductive uh much more impressive and so we talk about the relative change but we don't talk about the absolute change so for example let's let's imagine that we have a hundred people and we go from a hundred people having something to 10 people having something uh that's uh, that's a very large reduction if you have instead one person out of 100 who has this, and then you go down to 0.1 person out of 100 who has this, it is the same relative difference, the same relative change that you see between these two scenarios. But as you can see, ab in absolute terms, it is very different. If you go, if you have 100, if 100% 100 of people have a disease and you can bring this down to 10% of people, that is a major difference. Whereas if you have 1% of people who have the disease, and you bring this down to 0.1%, it's still interesting, but it's not on the same scale. But if you report these changes as relative uh, reductions, which is the difference between how it was versus how it is now, uh, it's going to be the same in both scenario, scenarios, and it's going to look very impressive. And that's what happened with convalescent plasma. They were using relative risk reduction without putting them in a context and actually citing the absolute risk reduction. Also, let's point out that this was what we call an observational study. This was not a randomized study. So they did not have a group who got the plasma and a group who got a placebo, uh, because we don't know what other treatment the, the plasma patients underwent. But let's just look at the, the numbers here. So what, what um, um, uh, the numbers really showed was that people who were treated with the convalescent plasma that had a high dose of antibiotics. Uh, of those 13, roughly, I'm just rounding up uh, of the numbers, about 13% uh, uh, died. And uh, th that is the ones who had a low dose, 13% died. The ones who had a high dose of antibiotics, uh, only about 9% died. Uh, so after a week, so we we're just talking about a week. So the actual difference was only about 35% when you compare the, the number nine point something to 13 point something, that's a 35% difference. But the actual difference was only four people for every 100. So to say that 35 would have been saved out of every 100 is just totally wrong. Right. Four would have been saved from every 100. Now that's not ins insignificant, uh, certainly. So there is merit to the use of convalescent plasma. Uh, it's just that we would like to have more information. We'd like to see some randomized studies to make sure that it's the plasma that's that's really active. And again, uh, it's uh, not a breakthrough. This is technology that's been around for a while. It's been used in other conditions. It is an, an important tool, but that's that's all it is. I mean, well, to, to suggest that this was some game-changing thing is wrong. It, it would be a breakthrough if there was a study and it was shown to be great, but it's not a breakthrough in terms of a new technology. It would be a breakthrough no, in terms of... it's not of, a breakthrough in terms of numbers. There's a treatment, numbers. right. It's not right, a breakthrough right. in terms of numbers. Exactly. Because, you know, what we're talking about here anyway is seriously ill patients who are in the hospital and uh, who were diagnosed and three or four days subsequent to the diagnosis, they were treated with the plasma. And then they looked to see after a week, how many of them were alive. And when you translate this to, to absolute risk, about four people more would stay alive out of every hundred when they were treated. Don't know what the longer term consequences are because that wasn't uh, really. Yeah, I mean, anyway, so that's the story of, of plasma. Yeah, I mean, convalescent plasma has been used, uh, has been tried repeatedly with major infections in the past decade or two. I mean, we think about Ebola, but the problem with these studies is they were done in very few people who were very severely ill. Uh, there was no control being done. And each time the data is like, well, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work. And now we have something on a, on a bigger scale, but again, it's not a trial. Now there is a major Canadian uh, randomized trial on convalescent plasma for COVID-19 that is underway. So I'm hoping that in a few months, when these results are out, we will finally have a sort of definitive answer, slightly a more rigorous answer to this question of whether or not it works for COVID. And it's also very interesting that you know this emergency authorization, which is not the same as an FDA approval. I think that's also very important to, to point out. Uh, to get FDA approval for uh, any kind of process or for a drug, you have to have proper studies that shows the safety and, and the efficacy. 
in this case, it is really quote an emergency because let's face it, COVID-19 is an emergency situation. So the only thing that the FDA has said is that there is enough evidence that this is not likely to be harmful. So that's, that's why they are allowing the use. There was something else closely related to this, this time with the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, who came out with a rather curious uh, bit of, of advice saying that asymptomatic patients or people do not have to be tested for uh, COVID-19. This has aroused a lot of controversy and, and attack by the scientific community. Uh, it's hard to understand what is going on here because uh, we know that testing is extremely important. That's how you detect people to quarantine. So all of a sudden the CDC changes this, that asymptomatic people don't have to be tested. So uh, again, the suspicion is that it is the US, the federal government that has twisted some arms here uh, in order to make the testing look better because obviously if you don't test, you don't find. So uh, this is a, a very curious thing by, by the CDC. That's a huge deviation from everything they've said before. I mean, like we could watch more numbers go up or in the States then. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you know, this is the the uh, the Trump philosophy is that uh, if you don't test, it means that there are no cases, which of course is. Uh, and is it, it's very dangerous because it, I mean, it, it is looking like the politicization of public health agencies in the United mm -hmm. States. And if you can't trust in the scientific rigor of your public health agency because it's been politicized. Uh, that will have ramifications for public trust in, in healthcare and in science in the U.S. Yeah. Well, let me give Stephen Hahn, the commissioner, a, a bit of credit here because the next day he did walk it back, and he said that he didn't uh, he didn't describe this properly. Well, yes, he did not describe this properly. This is this is true. Didn't describe what the convalescent plasma or the testing the the, 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 the reduction plasma. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So he, he said that the 35% was unrealistic and yeah. Well, oh, it's going to end up being another hydroxychloroquine type of thing Yes. with all the hype and everything. And then yeah. they didn't do the studies and then, well, maybe not, you know, we don't know. Well, also interestingly based... enough, you know, this, the oleandrin business, which came up the week before this right. extract of the oleander plant, which, uh, let's talk about that. Was, we didn't talk about it last week. was hyped by the my pillow, uh, guy and Ben Carson jumped on that bandwagon and of course Trump also talked about it but uh, I think that was very quickly swept away so I, I think that the, you know the advisors learned their lesson from the hydroxychloroquine and told them you better be quiet about this one you know what annoys me in the whole RNC this week is when Trump um He's kind of making offhanded comments, especially when he's in the room with other people, like part of the naturalization ceremony, and he's talking about COVID, and he and he'll make a comment about hydroxychloroquine, but then it's an off the cuff, also saying, "Oh, but we can't talk about that because you know what happened with that." Yeah. Like it's yeah. all based out of his, you know, exaggerative exaggeration remarks that something's going to happen, and then the media pounces and everyone pounces, and it gets out of hand, and then people chuckle when he says that in the room, and it's making. It's like making light of a very serious situation and his stupidity or other people, him and others. But it's also feeding a conspiracy theory, right? Because like, oh, we, we can't talk about this right. publicly because yeah. you know, they don't yeah. like it yeah. when we exactly. talk, we know what the truth is. It's feeding, it's feeding into that, exactly. Like poking- And also the, last you know, night uh, when Mike Pence was speaking and he spoke about uh, vaccines, yeah. I was totally unrealistic. I mean, to suggest that a vaccine is going to be available within a couple of months. So confidently. He said it they, so confidently. Yeah. This is. Uh, but, I mean, look, look at what's happening with Russia and even with China. They have an experimental vaccine that they're administering to some of their military personnel. What, I mean, it's been uh, some people have speculated that maybe Trump will again force an emergency authorization for an experimental vaccine before the election as a way of saying, Siri, I, I am your savior. And that would be devastating. This uh, Russian vaccine uh, that even Putin's daughter supposedly got, which we don't know is true or not, uh, 76 people got this. Okay. which is, <laughs> I mean, that's nothing, you know, there have been no phase three trials. Uh, they just uh, put this out there. Well, according maybe, to the website, maybe they, they hit up on something, but they certainly haven't uh, demonstrated that this is 
this we is don't know. I mean, according to the website for the for that particular Russian vaccine, the phase three trial was uh, again allegedly started a week or two ago. They want to start manufacturing in September. Uh, the 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 uh, the authorization that was given by the government was to start January first. So. The, the whole story was also sort of taken out of context. It's supposed to start really in January 1st, but as you mentioned, like they still haven't finished a, a phase three. They've barely begun yeah. the phase three trial. Yeah, and, uh, uh, and obviously researchers all over the world are working on the vaccines and, and there are different approaches to this. Like the, the Oxford study, which has gotten a lot of publicity, is actually about a, a virus uh, that was uh, isolated from chimpanzees and then manipulated so that one of the so-called spike proteins, these are these the outcroppings that we see in the classic picture, that one of those was manipulated to, to uh, basically make it uh, equivalent to the, uh, the one that we have in the SARS-CoV-2. And uh, the idea is to trick the immune system into thinking that this is the, the virus and have it generate antibodies to that so that when the real virus is encountered, it will neutralize it. That's, you know, and there are other uh, approaches too. The, um, the American vaccine that was touted is with messenger RNA, where they actually are uh, injecting genetic material that codes for the production of one of these spike proteins, again, trying to trick the, the system. Uh, and uh, then there are other ways that you can inactivate the actual virus itself and inject that. So something will eventually come out and there'll be vaccines, not in a month. And certainly we will not have evidence that they work in a month. When you speak to any of the researchers, they say minimum is two years in order to know whether or not it's safe or, or effective. But, but there might be enough pressure to, to pump out one of these vaccines before it has been properly uh, tested. And that, of course, could uh, could lead to tragic uh, results. It really, and as someone said on Facebook, it increases the vaccine hesitancy. You know that that group of people, which uh, I would now need to include myself in this particular yes. aspect, right? I'm not vaccine hesitant when it comes to uh, normal vaccines and the measles and everything, but when it comes to this particular vaccine, I'm not getting one in two months. You know, and. Uh, <laughs> So the distrust of vaccines is going to increase right. more, but I don't want to say distrust because I do trust them and I trust scientific rigor, right? I'm just hesitant that things need to proceed in due course. So, but, but maybe this is a good segue um, because I have a question that maybe other people feel as well. Uh, this past week we heard of, I think there might be three, but definitely one, um, uh, a case of reinfection, right? So when you talk about antibodies, and the vaccine, we could also say that you, when someone has antibodies, it's, it's in relation to that particular mutated, you know, SARS-CoV-2, but if it mutates again, then those antibodies are not for the mutation, right? Or we could talk about that and how maybe yeah. reinfection happens. Well, first of all, we don't really know how long these antibodies last, even in someone who's really infected. We, we don't know that. There's uh, unfortunately some evidence that they don't last more than about three months. And the question of reinfection has emerged uh, because there's evidence from a, a, a patient in China uh, that this really was a reinfection. And uh, he had uh, been diagnosed uh, with proper you know, testing, uh, I guess in, in March as having uh, COVID from which he recovered. And now he seems to have encountered it again but uh, the testing now shows, and they did the genetic testing of the virus, and uh, the virus, of course, every time that it multiplies inside the body can make subtle changes. They, it doesn't change how infective it is, uh, but it just, it, it can kind of pinpoint exactly where that virus came from. And what they found in this case is that the, the virus that infected him now was not the same one as he had uh, before. There were just the, these subtle differences in the genetics of the virus. And uh, although there has been suspicious be suspicions before of reinfection, this is the first time that there seems to be real scientific evidence that, uh, that this has happened. And this is not a good thing because it also you know, casts a shadow on all of the vaccines that are being developed. Well, I read because, that also this particular yeah. patient, it might be because he was very asymptomatic. 
Um, but then it still also makes you wonder, I mean, it looked like if someone was sick, were they sick enough? You know, is the, is the vaccine going to help me? Where, where did I lie on the spectrum of infection? You know? I mean, we also have to point out, like, we don't know. I mean, I don't know because it hasn't been published yet. I, I don't know if the, if this guy ever developed antibodies against because some people after right. an infection they never develop antibodies. So he might be a special case. There's also the possibility that it was laboratory contamination like when they did the sequencing of the genetic material of the of the virus. Maybe it was contamination from from the lab. Like we don't know that yet. It is one case. It is. So somewhat, you know, worrying and eye opening, and I'm I'm awaiting to see the publication. But there are other factors that could explain this. But yeah, it's it is it is worrying. Another interesting development that that came out actually yesterday was once again the FDA uh, under another emergency authorization came out uh, with an authorization of a spray that is going to be used uh, on airplanes. American Airlines is the, is the one that got the, the okay for this. And um, it's a spray that is supposed to coat everything with a very, very thin polymer layer uh, that, that somehow destroys any virus that is on the surface. Now, I'm very vague about this because they are very vague about it. The, the, the data is said to be proprietary the only thing that they have done is furnished FDA with some evidence that that it works, but they have not said what it is, what what the disinfectant in in this is, and uh, we're talking here about something that's going to be sprayed inside of an airplane. So there's of course always the potential of residue in the air that people will be inhaling this. Again, it, this this seems that that uh, this this is uh, being uh, pushed out too quickly especially when it comes to surfaces, because surfaces are not a prime vehicle for transmitting this virus. The, the virus is transmitted by droplets, this we know. And of course, it is airborne. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's when it comes out of your nose or out of your mouth, it's in the air. So that, that is airborne. Some of it will settle on a surface, and in a you know in a theoretical scenario, it's possible if someone has coughed on a surface or sneezed on it, and you touch it, then you touch your face. Yeah, it's, it's possible. This is a very very unlikely method of, of conveyance, and now they have uh, okayed this uh, unknown disinfectant, and it's going to be sprayed in airplanes without, I think, enough toxicological evidence, especially given the fact that, that it may not be necessary uh, because you know, the surface contamination is, is not such an uh, important way of, of transmitting this. And again, it, this seems to be uh, coming from the top uh, because, again, it is something that the government can talk about, that you know, here is a, it's a, a revolutionary new product. Well, uh, I would Made like in the USA. Made in the USA, yes. Yes, they emphasize that. <laughs> of course. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I would like to see the the chemistry here. I'm not sure what this is, but <clears throat> another. Uh, but can I? Sorry, it, can I ask a question yeah. before you move on? Um, so, coronavirus is shown. We now know not to spread that much on surface, or not to spread on surfaces, uh, versus what we thought in March. But other viruses can spread on surfaces, right? So I think maybe people are also just being extra vigilant, which I do appreciate because now what came out of this is me just like being more cognizant about washing my hands and, you know, washing them well and and being aware of surfaces that I'm touching and everything. So I, now maybe it's not a bad thing that- No, I mean, look, uh, the hygiene is good. Thing. Public hygiene is good, you know, right. that, that, that's for sure. But- I mean, but the flu, the flu, uh, which we could talk about now, and we'll talk about in a few weeks when Dr. Debbie is on. But um, you know, that's that gets spread on surfaces, right? Well, it's the same thing. It's you have to touch a surface and then touch your face, right? Uh, you know, I, it's uh, that's the same for all viruses, except that the the virus that we're talking about here is more infective than than the flu virus, right? You know, so, but, so smaller dose can probably cause a problem. So, so the surfaces, even if it's not, you can't really spread it via surfaces. But if I were to touch a surface and then touch my face, I could still get infected. Right? Yes, yes. Like so I, I'm a course. face toucher, and I yeah. see it on the on the webcast, yeah. and I I know because I end up tasting Purell in my mouth at some point throughout the day. So you know, that, which is another issue. The touching because of my face, people the touching Purell, my face. because oh. the, the Purell is scented. And uh, there's no reason horrible. for it to be scented. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, s smells are 
potentially composed of hundreds of different compounds, some of which are irritants. And some people who have asthma, for example, yeah. will will you know have an issue with smells. In fact, this this comes up uh, with uh, fabric softeners, the fabric softener sheets that you put yes. into the dryer. Yes. You know, some people are sensitive uh, to that. And talking about that, yeah, <laughs> let me link this to COVID. Uh, the active ingredient in those fabric softener sheets is a set of compounds called uh, quaternary ammonium compounds or quats. Mm. And these are not only fabric softeners. Uh, uh, in the on the fabric softener, they work by neutralizing the static electricity that you know that you would get in your dryer if you don't have this in there. Uh, but these are also very effective disinfectants against viruses and, and against bacteria, and they are very very commonly used. And uh, you know many of the disinfectant solutions that you now buy. Uh, you know, in, in the pharmacy to clean surfaces are based on these quaternary ammonium compounds. Anything, when you look at the ingredients, anything that has ammonium something at the end belongs into this category. And uh, there is some evidence, although again, it's, it's not powerful evidence, but there, there's evidence from animal studies that these compounds have endocrine-like properties. That is, they have hormone-like properties. And this is something that we worry about, these endocrine uh, disruptors. And uh, there have been interesting cases in uh, uh, laboratories where they clean the floors with the uh, quads where the mice have had reproductive problems. So again, this, this is also not something that we just want to be callously spraying around. Uh, these, are, these are things that are going to be more and more studied now because of course all these issues are, are emerging. But you want to be very careful with you know, using disinfectants. You have to look at the risk benefit ratio, you know. Uh, yeah, it's, it's important to, to uh, inactivate uh, microbes on surfaces, but if you are going to be inhaling some of those compounds, some of those quads, uh, well, you know, maybe it, it's better to just use soap and water. Uh, I, I, I know that some of the schools um, were facing a little bit of that issue in their wording of the policies to the parents recently, because um, as I'm sure you know, there's been obviously Quebec schools are reopening and everything and all schools are implementing their own things. So, um, it was being said that don't they were reassuring parents we have major disinfectant sprays happening and everything and and, and i they, they said disinfectants and they might have even said well not pesticides because that wasn't it but the disinfectants and all of a sudden then the whole chat in the in the school zoom was all like what are you spraying with what are you you know it's oh, like yeah i mean there are, many, are different you kinds of, many different kinds of disinfectants the one that is now quite commonly used as hypochlorous acid uh, which seems to work very well, and it probably is the, the safest uh, of all of these because you need very low concentrations to, to uh, disinfect. But they also may be using some of these quads, I don't know. So, the, you know, the, the, obviously there's a le very legitimate concern about the going back to school is issue. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure that the Quebec government has thought this through properly. Uh, you know, so I mean, we have evidence of what happened in Israel. They went back to school and I, it wasn't countrywide, but in certain schools, there uh, was a spike. Yeah. Then we, we saw this at other institutions too, University of North Carolina. They started back in classes. What did they do? A couple of weeks later, cases went up and they had to close down again. Quebec was so, so great at the beginning. We were the first one to really take action and put down the hammer and you know, yeah. and we were, we were setting an example for the rest of Canada. And now we've deviated from the other provinces in terms of- Of course, there are all kinds of petitions now circulating here in Quebec uh, to, to try to push back the, the opening or at least uh, offer the possibility of online right. uh, teaching. To let parents- Which, teach which they are, are not, uh, not offering. Right. So I mean, the government is going to have to, to readdress this because there's just too much unhappiness in the, in the population. Yeah. Uh, and also, you know, over the last week or so, we, we saw the new cases in Quebec dip to below 100, which is good. It was going the right direction. Yesterday and today, it's above uh, 100 and really? again. So there, there are some worrisome uh, things here. Yeah. Um, another interesting development is happening, believe it or not, is fabrics that are resistant to the coronavirus. 
It was like clothing. last time with the uh, the, the sun. Remember? Yeah, all, sun clothing. all kinds of things. Sweaters, shirts, socks that have antiviral properties. So I've been looking into this and uh, there's one thing that they all have in common, which is that they all made with some kind of silver. They either have very thin silver fibers uh, in it or they have been uh, treated with a silver solution. And uh, certainly it is uh, uh, possible that this will have some antiviral effect because silver does do, do that. But in the global <laughs> way of looking at this, this is, this is really irrelevant. Uh, first of all, you don't, to transmit this disease through clothes. I mean, that, you know, yes, if you're working in a hospital, that's a different story. You come home, you would change your, your clothes. But for the average person to have to wear uh, silver uh, clothing, I, I think is- uh, Why silver it, and not, this is a, a silly question probably, but um, we had a lot of talk about copper masks and copper. Yeah, so, well, silver is has uh, greater antiviral properties than copper. But copper can also be used. I mean, copper is used in masks uh, right. as well. Uh, but uh, you know, one one problem with this is that it may distract from the things that we really should be doing, which is the physical distancing and the the frequent washing of of, of hands. This is what we really know works. And you know, more and more information is coming out about the benefits of masks. And uh, you know there are all of these studies now that have been done uh, where with sophisticated equipment, uh, you can see what is going through the mask and you can see the droplets coming out and virtually every, every kind of mask will block most of it. Uh, I, the surgical masks I, I find the, the most convenient and yeah. they also, they, they perform uh, uh, very well. And can, so, I have a question. Um, a lot of my friends and I see influencers and everything on Instagram talking about the mask chains with chains or beads for kids. Jonathan, I don't know, you look, you don't know. So you basically wear them. It's as if like in the in the olden days and now, which is stylish, um, with, with glasses or sunglasses, you, you would put the things on and then you have yeah. them rest here and whatever. So that was for glasses. It's coming back into style. And now it's coming for masks. So you basically clip, clip on the mask and there's very cute ones and there's ones with, you know, the kids' names and everything. And even now, not only because it's it's a string around your neck, which is also sometimes dangerous. Uh, well, it is dangerous for children. There's a magnetic clasp on the back so it can easily snap off if, God forbid, something happened. Um, so I would like to get one of those, you know, chains because it is annoying going into a grocery store, going in, like just running errands for the day. Uh, and I am wearing the same mask because it's considered like a one-time use for that chunk of time. I'm putting it on the ground, or on on my car seat. I'm putting it on the on the you know the mirror. I'm putting it in my pocket or in a Ziploc bag in my pocket. I really would just like to put it down. But is that not hygienic? Because if all the crap of other aerosols are getting on exactly. the, and all of a sudden you're wearing it on your shirt and everything like that, right? Plus, so, you're also introducing new surfaces, right? That you now have to worry about. Although uh, obviously someone will come up with uh, silver or copper chains and of, claim of that they have antiviral uh, right. uh, properties. The the more you handle that mask, the more the chance that that somehow the virus is going to be introduced onto onto the onto the mask. So, uh, so that's yeah, not... I don't see the real benefit of uh, of that. Oh. Where where are they selling these? No, everywhere. I saw Debbie wearing one. I mean, I, I'm not, I, this is not a bad thing. You're shaming <laughs> her. I, uh, I she's not I even here I, to defend herself. I think I saw Debbie wearing one. I've seen other, you know, other moms and, and, and they're selling it for kids in school because, and I don't, again, you have to outweigh the risk the same way if I had kids and I, you know, I would probably have my kids in a backyard camp and having them home alone and isolated because there's more risk for that. But, you know, you don't want the kids all of a sudden, the mask is on the ground, the mask in the pocket. Where is the mask? I rather have my child wear well, the mask it should be chain. on the face. That's it what is a on, mask it is, is on the face, but like then but if you're eating, if you're reading, if you're whatever for the kids, all they have to do is go like that. So I do get it. Um, and again, they're getting more sophisticated because the fact that they came up with the magnet clasp is a very, you know, is a, is a good idea. It's a safety thing. 
Um, but I could show you, Joe, there's lots of different ones. And I'm, I'm so I bet you someone will send you one that says Dr. Joe with a bead and like a little duck or something. And they're very convenient. I mean, Joe, what are you and Jonathan, how are you handling your masks when you go? Because I find it really, really annoying now. Yeah. So I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, I haven't changed how I use my masks since the beginning of, of the pandemic, which is that when I go out, before I go out, I wash my hands. Yeah. I put the mask on, uh, which has been cleaned before. So it's clean. It's hanging there. I put it on. I go outside. I do not touch it while I'm outside with very, very few exceptions. And when I come back home, I wash my hands. I, I, I pour some water in the, in the sink. I put some uh, laundry detergent in there and then I throw my mask in there and I wash my hands again. And then afterwards I rinse it and I hang it to dry. So uh -huh. I do not take it off while I'm out of the house. Now and I you, realize of course with kids who are, and they have to eat at some point, like you will have to remove it, but you have to be very, and when I do have to remove it, I bring a Ziploc bag with me. Yeah. I always take it from the ear loops yeah. out. I fold it so that the outside is inside. I put it inside of a, uh, of a Ziploc bag and that's where it stay where it stays until I have to put it on again. So you fold how do you fold it? Sorry, like the outside the of the out, mask. The outside is... part might have virus on it, so you want right. to you want to keep it inside it. the bundle. So it doesn't get on the Ziploc, let's say. Yes, exactly. I use these the so-called surgical ones. Yeah, those are those are those are these. Uh, I like this because you can kind of pinch your nose and then yeah. you you get a, a nice uh, seal. Now, interestingly enough, you don't want that seal to be too tight either because what the studies have shown is that if it is extremely tight, then whatever breath comes out from the sides, it comes out at a greater pressure. I mean, obviously. Mm -hmm. Because you know, you're, you're forcing your no breath out. To go. And it will travel further. So every day we learn more and more about this, you know, that-, that The you, speed you, of breath. Oh yeah, <laughs> I mean, you, 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 you have to have the mask that fits just right not too loose, not too tight. I have the to say- The it, Goldilocks uh, mask. Yes, so, the Goldilocks So effect. now you, you just look frightening, actually. <laughs> um, but I find it very hard to buy a mask because obviously you can't, you can't try, you can't return, you know? So you're investing, I mean, I know again, moms who've invested lots of money just to find the best one for their kids or the best one for themselves. Um, I've, bought an, I've bought ones that, are, that end up being too small that when I open my mouth, like if I were to, go like that then they they go below my nose so jonathan you open your mouth you know you never do that yeah joe i, I mean jonathan i'm very impressed like you really don't touch it when you're out like i i don't but I you keep, know like I, squeezing the top and i i've i've worked in forensics and i've worked in all these labs where you have to be so mindful of the surfaces that you touch and where your hands have been and what's been disinfected and not when you work with rna in the lab you know the, the joke is that you know you look at rna and it, and it dissolves in front of your eyes so if you want to work with RNA, you have to be extra, extra careful because you have these enzymes on your skin that can uh. Uh, really cut up the RNA. So I, I come from a background where you have to be very careful. You have to be very mindful about these things. Right. So for me, the learning curve was was not very steep. But for somebody right. who's never done this, all of a sudden you realize, oh my God, I'm touching my face all the time. Yeah. So yeah, it, it takes a bit of, a, of of getting used to it. Are those the the mask chains in, in question? Oh yeah, just that's one example. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Joe, Are tell me. Over? I mean, well, they're going to end up probably making silver and everything like that for yeah, sure. Yeah, some of them are beaded with different colors. Some yeah. of them are kind of gold uh, in, in color and all that. I mean, this is a, a very uh, <laughs> luxurious looking. Oh yeah, yeah, one there. Like, for sure. Here, Mass Chains Montreal. You know, I'm giving her. I mean, I uh, here. Yeah, I, I do share I, the here. same concerns as Joe, which is that here. when you, yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting, but that's the thing that if you are remo removing your mask and it's hanging down on this chain and the inside of your mask is now facing outwards and somebody who is infected comes near you and then a droplet spray, then you are, you're breathing this in. You're, it's touching your face when you put your mask back on. So this, that's always an, an, a potential issue. I guess it would be the inside. I mean, technically you would think it's the outside of your mask facing outward, but you can always turn. It depends with always... the chain. Yeah, that, there exactly. you go. I, I, uh, I Joe, I want to ask you, although I'm not so sure. Um, you're maybe you're not as careful. I don't know, but um, but you seem to take be, be taking COVID nineteen pretty seriously. But um, how do you handle your mask when, when you're you know if you go to the grocery store and then you go to McGill? Like what what are you where where's the in between? Like what do you do? Whenever I whenever I go inside anywhere, I I put it on. Right, and then when you take it off, I take it off and. Yeah, yeah, but do you have like a ritual? Like you take it off from the side. I yeah, of course. That. I mean, you take yeah. it off by holding the. And do you put it on the on your rear view? Like, what do you do? 
Are you like a I fuzzy put dicer? On, I, put it, I put it on the seat beside me. You put it on the seat. So it's like Joe but in the I, mask I, in the car. Know, I, I wouldn't use it more than once. Right. So you, you throw them out. Yeah. Yeah. Because I also, I heard from someone, even with the disposables, they're like, yeah, I use it for a few days and I throw them out. And we were like, what? That's I, think you, I think you probably can. You think? I think you can. Yeah. So again, and we had questions of that, like that on Facebook too. I mean, we keep, not we, more so my husband, but he'll use the mask and then he'll leave it in the car and then he'll use the, he'll go back and do another errand the next day or something like that. And then use the same mask, like a cloth one. Um, I mean, if it's hot, like it's not as hot anymore, but I'm wondering like, if would the virus go away? Um, is it best? Like it, it's probably best to just wash it after each use. Like Jonathan, I, I also, I usually wash and, it. And also for the environment, like if you're throwing out, dispo- if everyone were throwing out disposable masks yeah. every day, that, that's, oh, that's, that's true. Amazing. It's, it's not, uh, yeah, it's I, environmentally. Yeah. I heard they've been finding uh, a ton course, in oceans. Every, every time that you're washing your mask with detergent, that also contributes to environmental pollution. True. Detergents are one of the biggest environmental problems. I'm just using hand soap when I wash with hot water in the sink or something. Oh, that's good enough. Okay. Yeah. That's good enough. What else? I'm trying to see. Let me see if we have any. Um, uh, oh, here. This is also, this is, you know, it'll be interesting to see in the future what allergies and kids and if they're more, uh, you know, immunosuppressed with germs. So this, with the incessant disinfection of all surfaces, is there any long-term risk from not exposing ourselves, especially children to germs? Uh, It's possible. I mean, you know, there's this so-called hygiene hypothesis that says that the reason that we are seeing more allergies today is because kids are not exposed early in life to, to real problematic invaders. And uh, therefore the, uh, immune system makes a mistake and it targets substances that normally would not be such a problem, like you know the, uh, the antigen in peanuts, let's say. And there we actually now know, this is, has been quite well you know, uh, proven, that the best way to prevent allergies to peanuts in the future is to expose children early on to, to peanuts, not mm-hmm. to, to keep them away for two years. As, you know. right. So it, it may be that all of this uh, disinfecting and cleaning all surfaces, uh, I mean, let's face it, this destroys not only the, uh, the coronavirus, this is uh, you know, active against all kinds of microbes, including you know, various bacteria. And um, who knows what the long-term consequences will be of our reduced exposure to this. There are going to be many, many long-term consequences of, yes. uh, of COVID-19, mm-hmm. uh, physical consequences and mental consequences and Economic. sociological consequences. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is, a, this is a situation that has, uh, you know, uh, I mean, even the 1918 uh, uh, flu uh, did not have the same kind of, you know, uh, impact as this is is going to have because they didn't know as much about what to worry about. We know too much now. We know too much, and and there's a lot of things to uh, to worry about. So it's 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 not a happy situation. And you know, one of my major concerns is that is that there are too many eggs that are being put in the in this vaccine uh, basket. Uh, it's it is not going to be the solution to this problem. For many different reasons. One, I think that the time frame is unrealistic, uh, although it is impressive how much science has been done in the last, you know, few months. That is impressive. But no matter what, you cannot take shortcuts on testing this. You have to have years of, of testing to know just what the long-term efficacy and safety of, of, of this is. And with the vaccine hesitancy and the fact that, you know, even at best, a vaccine will you know, induce maybe 70% herd immunity. Put that together with what is it, the 20 to 25% of people who are going to refuse to take the vaccine. So it's hard to see how, even with a 70% effective vaccine, how you're going to achieve herd immunity. So uh, I I wish I could be more optimistic about this because, you know, I, I, I... I usually, you know, don't don't think that all of the uh, 
you know, the claims against uh, you know toxic chemicals and all of this are, are well founded, and I you know I normally dismiss a lot of those, but this is a different story. This well, this is real. That's why I, I even think what you said about the dis- you know the spraying of the disinfectant in the airlines. Yeah, it's not something that you would normally say because the dose makes the poison and all those things. But we do need to know we're spraying in this confined space. It's going to be lingering on there. We're breathing it for X amount of hours in the air. I mean, at least tell us what the chemicals are, so people like exactly. you, so people like you, can assess yeah. them for us, right? I, I this is something that I, I find mind boggling that that uh, the FDA will okay something where the company says that these are proprietary chemicals, and although they obviously have furnished some evidence that it does have an antiviral effect. But I would still like to see what this is. You know. I mean, so are we blaming the FDA and the CDC and all those kind of ridiculous things that they've been doing all on politics and the politicization? Well, of I, I think health? there's an awful lot of politicization there. Yes. So uh, versus so. just there uh, being uh, desperate to find something. I, I think there's the, the uh, desperate uh, goal now to win the election. Right. And to come up with miracles. I mean, you know, Trump has said that eventually this, this will like a miracle disappear. Well, Pence he said wants that to yesterday make that too. miracle happen before November 3rd. Yeah. Not yeah. going to happen. I've never known uh, anyone to rush a miracle. Yes. <laughs> yes. And uh, I, I think that they they are going to try to rush out this uh, this vaccine. And as I said, I, I think it's even unrealistic that even if there is a, a workable vaccine, effective vaccine, that that is not going to be the, the overall solution to this. Yeah. I mean, uh, we will come out of this somehow. We will never be the same. We will learn to somehow live with this, just like we're, you know, learning to live with the, with the flu. Yes, we're going to be coexisting with COVID. It's just too bad. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, we will have Paul Offit on, just a little plug. We're going to have Dr. Paul Offit back, the vaccine expert, uh, September 24th to talk about all the new developments that's been happening. And Yes, and he's been on CNN quite a lot. A lot, and, yeah. And uh, he, he, of course, is, is, you know, the horse's mouth. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's going to be good to have him. Yeah. Also, while we are in the plugging mood, uh, let's plug our Trottier Public Science Symposium, which is coming up in October. Coming up in October, which is like around the corner now that all of a sudden the cooler weather is upon us. Um, We're doing it online this year, obviously. Uh, We are doing two successive Mondays. So October 19th and October 26th. And the theme this year is In Whom Do We Trust? Which is um, very topical, obviously. Um, We have four amazing speakers and all the information is on our website, actually. McGill.ca slash OSS. and you could find all the info there. We are asking people to register, even though it is on YouTube and the links are available, but please register. So we do have um, a sense of who's coming. Um, And uh, yeah, so we're really excited about that. And we'll be continuing to plug it. Who are are our speakers? Our speakers. So one is Britt Hermes, who is a former naturopath. um, And she will talk about how when she was a naturopath and then all of a sudden things changed and why, why then she started to become skeptical. And now she is pursuing her PhD in, I forget exactly what, Jonathan, you might, but in science. Some molecular science, biology right. uh, area. The Masters of Science, now she's doing a PhD and she's an amazing speaker and we'll hear about her journey. Um, and then we have Brendan Nyhan, who's a perfect professor of government at Dartmouth. And he will be talking about fake news, but also addressing some of like the medical science aspects, but he's done a lot on, um, uh, on politics and, and fake news. And then we have, so that's the first week, that's the 19th. And the following week, the 26th, we have Wendy Zuckerman, who is a science journalist and the host of the very cool podcast called Science Versus. And I um, encourage everyone to look it up and listen. She's she's really awesome. Um, And she'll be talking about the virus itself and also covering this uh, science journalism in the state of COVID right now. Um, And also Anthony Warner, who is known as the Angry Chef. Um, and he's a chef and a food writer, and he's had some also very great books. And he is a chef, and over time, he just realized kind of like what is happening in the world of food and nutrition, and people believing things, and um, and food scarcity, and food safety, and uh, world hunger, and all these things. So he'll be talking about that. Uh, it's gonna be good. It's gonna be really good. So look very good. Oh, well, thanks everyone, and we'll be back uh, in two weeks' time. 
and we will keep investigating COVID-19. Now, let me leave you with the classic words of Sherlock Holmes. It's a capital mistake to theorize before one has data, because then one insensibly begins to fit the facts to the theory instead of the other way around. And we see a lot of this happening now where people are trying to, to muscle in uh, the facts to, to some pet theory. And that's not the way things should work. Let's collect the data, make our observations, and come to the appropriate conclusion. Conclusions. Here, here. <laughs> All right. We'll see everyone in two weeks. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.